Hello, this is the second of my videos on solving challenge problems in multivariable calculus. We're typically doing problems from the calculus book, multivariable calculus book by Rogoski and Adams, third edition. In this video, we're doing problem 76 from section 11.1. .1. We'll be proving, or prove might be too strong a word, verifying, confirming that the tangent line at an arbitrary point P on this red curve here that you see, this cycloid, so this is supposed to be P right here, that dot, always passes through the top point on the rolling circle, right there. The circle is generating the cycloid as the circle moves to the right. This point P uh, moves along the circle, but it also traces the cycloid. I'm going to show you a mathematical visualization of this to help you see this in a minute. Always passes through the top point of the rolling circle as indicated in the figure below. For simplicity, we'll assume this generating circle has a radius of 1. I'm not interested in deriving the parametric equations for this cycloid. Here they are. x equals t minus sine t and y equals 1 minus cos t. That is a good exercise for you to try to derive these equations or maybe look up the derivation. I'm just going to use these equations okay, to help me solve this problem to verify that this tangent line goes through that top point. Right now I'm going to go to my Mathematica to show you uh, uh, how I generated this picture and make an animation of it. So this is my Mathematica note notebook where I'm going to make pictures and animations related to problems that we're solving. We're doing again this problem 76 from section 11.1 .1 in this video, tangent to a cycloid intersecting the rolling circle at the top. And you don't have to know Mathematica code or even want to learn Mathematica code unless you're interested. But we are going to see that this generates, first of all, the static picture that was in the, on the piece of paper that I just showed you. Here it is. Here's the code that generates this. I will give you a little hint that in generating this code, I use the concept of a velocity vector, which I'm not going to talk about in this video. So there's our picture. And then to understand it better, we can also make an animation of this. And this code here generates the animation of a rolling cycloid. I put the tangent line and the cycloid itself in this animation as well, as you can see. So you can see the black dot that moves around the circle is the point P. You can see you've got a black dot at the top of the circle. You can see you've got the cycloid in red. That's the path of the black dot through space. And you've got the ta tangent line um, through the black dot tangent line for the cycloid at any given moment in time. For example, right here, this is the tangent line to this red curve at that point, and it passes through the top of the circle. So that's pretty interesting. So if you were a bug traveling on a wheel like this, um, and you focused on your direction of motion, not along the wheel, but in space, in a plane, in this two-dimensional picture here, if you focus on your direction of motion at any instant in time, you would be looking, if you could see through the wheel at least, you would be looking directly at the top of this of this wheel no matter what time you're at. Pretty cool. All right, now we're going to go back to the uh, solving the problem. So now we're back to the problem at hand. And so the goal again is to show that for an arbitrary point on this red curve on the cycloid, let the tangent line to that point that curve passes through the top of the circle that generates the cycloid, the wheel, so to speak, as the wheel moves. And so what, how, what kind of strategy should we use? Well, anytime you have a line, almost all the time that I can think of, you're going to want the equation of the line. So in my mind, the initial key idea to help us solve the problem is to think about well, first of all, an arbitrary moment in time, t equals, say, b. I will often use b as an arbitrary moment in time. I often do that in my Mathematica, as I did in what I just showed you there. It might be a good idea to find the equation of the tangent line as an xy equation. And if, for that given moment of time, we can show that that tangent line passes through this point, maybe by plugging in a specific value into the tangent line, 
then we should be able to have the problem solved. Technically, maybe not really a proof, but a verification. Enough to convince most, most people. Again, my students, if you're watching this, you need to write out your answers in complete sentences. I'm showing you the idea of how to think about it. There's also a key equation we need. Um, I'm not going to derive this equation right away. Maybe at the end of the video, if i got a little time, I'll talk about how to derive it. The key equation is, when you've got a system of parametric equations like this, x equals f of t, this would be the f of t like right there, t minus sine t, and y equals g of t, that would be the g of t function here, that, well, at least if your graph passes the vertical line test so that y could be thought of as a function of x, as is the case with the cycloid here, you could find the slope, dy dx, of the red curve at any given point as a ratio dy dt divided by dx dt. Now this is a little confusing because you might be saying, well, isn't dy dx a function of x and aren't dy dt and dx dt functions of t? And yes, that's true, but at any given moment in time, you're going to be at a certain point. For any given t value, you're going to have a certain x and y value. And so you always plug in the corresponding t values for the given x and y value into the dy dt and dx dt equations to find the slope at that given point. They're related. Okay? So I'm going to use that. Again, probably will spend the last few minutes talking about deriving it. It won't really be a proof, it'll be a derivation, an intuitive justification based on the chain rule ultimately. But now I want to use these things. I want to go ahead and do these calculations for these equations. So first of all, we have dx dt. Based on this equation, it's the derivative of f. It's, it's f prime of t. Take the derivative of that. The derivative of t is 1. And then the derivative of minus sine t would be minus cosine t. So there's dx dt. dy dt is the derivative of the function g. Take the derivative of this function, 1 minus cosine t. The derivative of cosine of t is negative sine of t. So the derivative of negative cosine of t is positive sine of t. And of course, the derivative of 1 is 0. So we get a derivative of sine of t. Okay. Now, where do we go from here? So p at an arbitrary moment in time, t equals b, has coordinates, x and y coordinates, that can be found by plugging b into f and g. So I'm imagining b to be the moment in time when I happen to be at this point. Okay, so that's the coordinates of this point, b minus sine b and 1 minus cosine b. And that is the moment in time, t equals b, when I'm at this point. Therefore, I can take the ratio of these two things as shown up here to find the slope of this green tangent line at that moment in time, t equals b. Let's go ahead and do that over here. Use a different color dy dx. Hope this notation is not too confusing. Evaluated at the moment in time t equals b, which means x and y are these two things. It's found with this ratio, <clears throat> dy dt divided by dx dt, this divided by that, plug in t equals b. Sine of b divided by 1 minus cosine of b. So in terms of that moment in time b, that's the slope of this tangent line to the cycloid at that point. Right? Make sure you understand that. All right, so how do we use that? Well, you got a line, and you happen to know the slope, and a point on that line, you can find the equation of the line. The equation of the tangent line as an equation in the variables x and y for fixed b 
would be y equals the slope, which is this, sine b over 1 minus cos b times x plus the y-intercept, but uh, it's probably better to do it this way. Think of it maybe in what you might call point-slope form. Multiply this by x minus the first coordinate of this point, which is b minus sine b. And then add onto that the second coordinate of this point, which is 1 minus cos b. Think of b as fixed. This is some fixed number. This is some fixed number. This is some fixed number. X and Y are the variables in this equation. All right, so now how do we use this? How do we verify that it goes through this point? Well, we'd have to know the coordinates of this point as well. Its second coordinate is two. It's always at the top of the wheel. That's part of the point of the problem. What's its first coordinate? Well, I'm not really gonna prove this, but its first coordinate is actually b. I hope that makes some sense. The wheel is moving to the right. It's the center of the wheel is at the point b comma 1 time, which is the same as b, is the x-coordinate of the center of the wheel is the x-coordinate of the top of the wheel and the bottom of the wheel. Okay. So what I really want to do now is I really want to replace x with b in this equation and see if I get an output of 2. Let x equal b. What happens? This becomes sine b over 1 minus cos b times b minus, in parentheses, b minus sine b, and yeah, the b's are going to cancel that, sounds good perhaps, plus 1 minus cos b. This simplifies then, distribute the minus sign through to just sine b. Multiply that times the sine b on the top, I get sine squared b. Over here, with that thing, i got to get a common denominator of 1 minus cos and b. So I'm really going to get a 1 minus cos b quantity squared all over 1 minus cos b. And I hope you're feeling good about this. If you expand this out, sine squared b plus cosine squared b is going to be in there. Sine squared b plus cos squared b, which is 1 plus 1 minus 2 cos b all over 1 minus cos b. Sine squared b plus cos squared b is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 minus 2 cos b over 1 minus cos b. Factor out the 2 and then cancel the 1 minus cos b. And this does indeed then simplify to 2. Oh, uh, well, well, wait a minute here. This seems to be done here, but wait a minute. What if we were dividing by zero here? We would not want to divide by zero. This would evidently be invalid if one minus cos b was zero, which can happen then when cosine of b is one. So as long as cosine of b is not one, this is valid. That would be equivalent to b not being an integer multiple of two pi and is an integer here. What happens at integer multiples of 2 pi? That's actually where you're at this point on the cycloid and the point where it comes back to the axis over here, etc. Technically speaking, there is no velocity vector at those points, though I suppose you could think, and technically speaking, there's no tangent line either, but I suppose you could kind of think of the tangent line as being vertical at those points, and it still goes to the top of the cycloid anyway, or the top of the circle anyway, when that happens. That's a separate argument, and I guess for my students, if I assign this problem, it's, it's fine not to really address that beyond what I just did. Okay, so basically we've solved the problem. We've shown that when x is b, that y is 2 along this tangent line, so this tangent line does go through the top point. Let me just spend, if you're interested, a minute or two just talking about the derivation of this key equation here.
Um, when you've got, again, your parametric equations, x is a function of t and a y is a function of t, x is f of t and a y is g of t, you may happen to be in a situation where the parametric curve uh, passes the vertical line test and therefore is also the graph of a function. y is a function of x. You could call that y equals h of x. And you could also write this as h of f of t if you like. You can realize that you can, and that would be the same as g of t, g of t could be thought of as a com composite function. Now you may not have a formula for h and you may not need a formula for h, but this is still theoretically true. And that's a situation where you can use the chain rule to differentiate, um, let's see, let's think of it this way, to differentiate y with respect to t. Of course it is the same as g prime of t, but I think of, if I think of it in terms of h and f, if I think of it in terms of dy dx and dx dt, the chain rule would say dy dx, dy dt is dy dx times dx dt in Leibniz notation. With function notation, that would be the same as h prime of f of t times f prime of t. And now, as long as you're not dividing by zero, you can divide both sides by dx dt and get dy dx equals the ratio dy dt divided by dx dt. Of course, mm, there is also the intuitive justification of this that uh, many engineers and scientists think of as imagine canceling the dt, but uh, that's not really what's happening. But it sometimes doesn't hurt to think of it that way. And that's the end of this video.